the same guy that sent me the the old um, King James Bible from 1720. Did I show you that, Brother George? Oh, man. It's got the man who owned it. It's printed in London. There were no publishing houses in the colonies, 1720. Uh, it's actually printed in 1708. So there's no American publishing houses back then. So everything was printed in England. And this one was in London. And it's leather bound. Um, but the material inside the leather was, it was like a, a slat of wood, real wood, not cardboard, not pressed. It was real wood. It was just amazing. But, um, and it, obviously it's in, you know, it's tattered and torn and there's a expression that says a, a Bible that's falling apart belongs to a Christian that ain't, you know. And, um, but anyway, it has the man's name written in it um, and he actually wrote in there um, on February the 4th um, in the year 1720 uh, my life was saved by God's assistance Simon what was his last name can't remember his last name but anyway the letter S was just I mean it was very ornate people don't talk that way anymore people don't write that way anymore but the same guy that sent me that sent me this, and it's a, I mean, it's a Catholic Bible. It's, it's their approved edition, and it has um, a, a, an encyclopedia of articles in here. And um, I've been kind of looking at these this afternoon, and it's got me, it does have me worked up. Because, I, I, and I'll just say, well, you're, why are you knocking everybody's religion? I'll knock any religion that requires a performance or especially a fee to give something that God says is supposed to be for free. Okay, and grace is called grace because it cannot be earned. Just like the love of your mom and your dad or your brother or your sister or whoever, the love of somebody who loves you is not earned. It's just, they just love you, okay? And they want to do things for you. And that's God. He loves us and what he does for us cannot be bought and therefore it cannot be sold. And I'm angry. Uh, when they start talking about if we just uh, destroy all the weapons and use that money to feed the poor, the earth would be better. I say chip off all the gold off of every religious idol in the world and use that to feed the poor. Then you'd have some feeding done. But um, it's, there's an article in here, I'll, I'll put it up on the screen in a minute, on papal infallibility. And the things that I just quoted to you just a few minutes ago are true. And, um, and, I, and I'll cover these again, probably on a Pastor Mike online. Um, but just, I don't know if you can see this. The article on papal infallibility is right here. Okay. Now see where this is in yellow? You see the yellow there? Okay. Pretend there's yellow there, because there is. I'm telling you, there is. Okay? And here's, here's, here's why this sticks out. Same, same page that the article on papal infallibility is listed is an index of forbidden books. And it says, books harmful to, to uh, Catholic faith, any book or publication whose material constitutes a danger to the faith or morals, of the readers prohibited. Forbidden books would include, number one, any non-Catholic edition or translation of the Holy Bible, for example, the King James Version. And they, that's the only one they mentioned. The only one they mentioned was the one that you've got. Okay? So then you keep reading and then you get to this article on infallibility, comma, papal. And I'll put that on the screen in just a minute. Let me, let me cover these verses. 
This is what we left off with last week. We're, this, we're studying what the Bible says about the Bible. And it's interesting because I read the article in there on the inerrancy of the, of the scriptures. And, and, the, and I've known this, the Catholic idea of the inerrancy of scriptures basically says that what God told Jeremiah to write down, as Jeremiah wrote it down, it is without error, but there are no Bibles without error except the ones that we gave you, the Catholic Church, okay? Then it turns around and says something about what the Pope says, and I'll read that in a minute, but from the Bible... I mentioned last week, the, the Bible can be rendered non-effective. Mark 7, 13, making the word of God of, of non-effect through your tradition. And in this encyclopedia of Catholic doctrine, that word pops up over and over. The Catholic tradition, the Catholic tradition, Catholic tradition. So it wasn't just the Jewish tradition that Jesus was commenting on. It's anybody's religious tradition that overrides what the scripture says, what the Bible says, okay? Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which is the, number one, which is what the Jews did. Then, number two, the Catholic Church come along and done the exact same thing. Whatever their tradition says trumps the word of God. Has been altered. Second Corinthians 2, 17, we're not as many which corrupt the word of God. It's been lied about, like that article lied about our Bible. Um... Have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. It's blasphemed. Uh, Titus 2.5, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So the Bible is hated amongst religion and religious people. The Bible is hated. It is blasphemed. The Antichrist in Romans 13 has a name of blasphemy written on one of his heads, the name of blasphemy. And there is one place in the Bible, John 17, that uses the phrase, Holy Father. And it's spoken by Jesus to his Father, God, not the Pope. That's blasphemy to ascribe the title, Holy Father, to a man who sits in the place of God, showing himself that he is God. Okay? So, here is what the Catholic Encyclopedia says about papal infallibility. The truth that the Pope, who is vested with the authority of the Vicar of Christ, that phrase means, he is Jesus Christ. On this earth, the Pope is Christ. He can, what he says has the authority of God. Everything that every Pope has said has the authority of Christ. So with the Pope is vested with the authority of the Vicar of Christ is divinely preserved from error whenever he defines a doctrine concerning faith or morals. That this special prerogative exists has always been the teaching of the Catholic Church. According to them, we've always said this. So in 1870, the Vatican Council declared, quote, it to be a dogma of divine revelation that when the, Vat that when the Roman pontiff speaks ex cathedra, that is, when he, using his office as shepherd and teacher of all Christians... <laughs> <laughs> in virtue of his apostolic authority, defines a doctrine of faith or morals to be held by the whole church. He, by the divine assistance, promised him in the blessed Peter. In other words, Peter is the one who has given the popes this power. Possesses that infallibility with which the divine redeemer was pleased to invest his church in the definition of doctrine on faith and morals. While he is acting as the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit guides his pronouncements so there is no error or possibility of error. Unquote. In other words, and this is what, and I didn't give you the, the entire article, but the, the entirety of the article says that it doesn't matter who the Pope was, 
And it doesn't matter how immoral he was. When he spoke as the vicar of Christ, his pronouncements cannot be denied. They must be accepted. Not even the cardinals, you know, the St. Louis cardinals, not even the, that was a joke, not even the cardinals have the power to overthrow what he says. It's not up for a vote. It's not up for a vote. This is, it's not a democracy. When they elect a pope, they elect a man who, when he speaks ex cathedra in that office of vicar of Christ, what he says is what God says. And if you don't believe that, you'll suffer damnation for eternity for not believing what that man said. Okay? So, yeah, I get worked up over that. Because let God be true and every man a liar. Every man a liar. All right? So, do we need to study what we believe about the Bible and why we believe it about the Bible because the idea is the Bible's written by men okay it was penned by men but as we see from the Bible itself and see the while the while the while the Pope asserts is called speaking out of two sides of your mouth while the Pope asserts that yes the Bible is the Word of God but so is what the Pope says so when the Pope speaks, however, his authority overrides what the, what the Bible says. And if you think that the Bible disagrees with the Pope, the church, the Catholic church would simply say to you, this is why we don't want you reading too much of the Bible which is why we didn't even want it printed in anything but Latin for about 1,500 years. We didn't want anybody to know. We would, we would speak it in the service, but if you didn't know Latin, you had no idea what was being said. And how dare John Wycliffe, a Catholic priest, decide on his own that he wanted to translate the Bible in the King's English for Englishmen to hear that the word of God didn't say what the priests were saying. And according to the other priests, he had no right to do that. He had no right to translate the Bible so that people would understand it. Because he saw the abuses. He saw the selling of indulgences. He saw as a man died, this still is done. A man would die, the priest would come down on his widow and say, your husband, I know his sins, he's in purgatory, he's in, he's in excruciating pain, he's going to be there for about a thousand years, we've got it figured. Now you've got some nice land, we see. He left you a pretty good chunk of change. So you hand over that to us, we'll say a special mass for your old dead husband, that'll shave off about 500 years, give or take, off of his sentence in purgatory, because he's still got to pay for most of his sins, because you knew him better than we did probably, right? Wink, wink. In other words, they would steal widows' houses, and they're still doing it. Still doing it to this day they're doing it. And I say, I'll say it again, because I've been doing this teaching on the gods of gold. God said, they're not gods. They're not gods. Don't bow, don't even make them. I say take every ounce of gold from every religion in the world and use that to feed the poor. Every bit of it. Because our religion is not based upon silver and or gold or anything related to that. Somebody say amen. Uh, whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says you want to be saved? Ask God. He'll save you. Amen. All right. Now, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer before I really get worked up. Father in heaven, we come before you tonight, not through the church, definitely not through my name or anybody's name in recorded history, except by the name of Jesus Christ. We come to you, Heavenly Father, 
We thank you, Lord, for the mediator who is Jesus Christ, who has borne our sins, carried, Father, our transgressions upon himself, taken them to the cross. And now we are redeemed. We are fully justified. And Father, we thank you that you, through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, gives us power to be, become sons of God. We ask you, Father, Lord, to guide us as we study your word tonight. Father, I would not for one second think that anything that I said was absolute truth. And I don't want anybody to think that. But Father, what we do know is that every word in this book is absolute truth. Because this book tells us that. But Father, we, f we ask you, God, that you would increase our faith, not diminish it. And God, that you would help us, Father, to follow you. Yes, our faith gets tried. It gets tempted. It'll always be that way while we're here on this earth. Father, help us, dear God, to pass the test of faith. So, Father, help us as we study your word tonight. Guide us. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So we've gotten, uh, let me just very quickly, let me go backwards, um, back before all of that. And here's what we're, we were going to cover on this study of God's Word. Why there are two Testaments, Old Testament, New Testament. And is one more than the other. Why are there 66 books? Why do we not accept, as is in that book, the Apocrypha? Why do we not accept that? Why we believe the superiority of God's Word written down instead of relying on oral tradition? And we just read part of that because men come up with traditions, stupid ones. Okay? Um, I was... That, that, uh, that thing about... Um, Apostolic indulgences. That was invented. That, that's not anywhere in the scriptures where if you carry a cross blessed by a pope, you're going to heaven for sure. Okay? That was made up to make money. Absolutely, no doubt in my mind. No pope anywhere ever blessed a crucifix and gave it away for free. Okay? They don't give nothing away. So... That's oral traditions that have crept in and override the doctrine of salvation. Superiority of written laws to govern all men, including kings. Okay? Uh, preachers don't make good politicians, and they're not supposed to. Preachers are supposed to tell politicians, this is what you're supposed to do. Okay? Um, including kings. Method of transmission from God to man. Inspiration of the originals. The preservation of every word in the original tongues. Preservation of every word in a translation. And the perfection of the Bible beyond question. Okay? And when I say beyond question, I, I'm not saying that I haven't at times in my life asked the question, is my Bible right? Ask. Jeremiah 33.3 3 says... Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. And so God doesn't mind you asking him questions, okay? As he guides you through the scriptures to give you the answers, you trust that God did say these words, okay? And that they have been faithfully transmitted to faithful men, men whose names are recorded for us in this book, we, and, and it's what we believe, and we believe that it's been preserved. So why, why do we have two, um, two sections of the book? We call them Old Testament, New Testament. Here's some verses, and I'll give you some examples then as uh, some typology as we go through the scriptures. Job 33, 14, for God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. So we have one witness in the Bible, God speaketh once, yea, twice. And we have a clear division in the Bible between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We have, we, and it's, it's not just what man, how man divided it. It's, it's a historical division. We, we know that the books of the Old Testament go back 400 years. The, the last one was 400 years before Christ ever came on the scene. 
so that would be 400 BC before Christ um, that was when the last book of the Old Testament was written and it goes all the way back uh, you've heard me teach you this who remembers it what what do we think the first book of the Bible ever penned was Job Job probably being the oldest book written out okay Job was more than likely lived about the same time as Abraham did um, who then wrote the book of Genesis who wrote the first book of the Bible I mean shouldn't he have been there you know when it said in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth who wrote the first book of the Bible huh did you say Noah okay I'm just checking okay because <laughs> it sounded like a Moses Noah thing huh? yeah <laughs> anyway yeah so Moses did but how did he how did Moses number one write about the creation of the earth when he wasn't there and how did Moses write about his own funeral at the end of Deuteronomy okay we'll cover that but anyway God speaketh once yea twice yet man perceiveth it not then Psalm 62 11 tells us God has spoken once twice have I heard this that power belongeth unto God so we have two verses telling us God speaketh once God speaketh twice now think along these lines the Word of God is two things according to what we believe number one it is Christ and it is our Bible Christ has his first coming which has already been done and his second coming which has yet to be done so that is God speaketh once his first coming God speaketh twice his second coming Genesis 41 if you remember when Pharaoh had the dreams about the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine how many times did he have that dream twice God speak and for and this is how Joseph explained it to to Pharaoh and for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice it is because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass so now you have three witnesses in the Bible three verses telling you God speaketh once God speaketh twice he gives the and Joseph even the dream that Joseph had concerning how his brethren were going and his mother and father were going to fall and worship him one day how many times did he have that dream he had it twice in two different ways okay so we we're having we're establishing this idea of God speaking once then God speaking twice and we have this again we have this historical division between the books of the Old Testament written from somewhere around 400 years before Christ to 4,000 years before Christ and then and that's a long span of time over about 4,000 years the Old Testament 39 books but then the New Testament written in a relatively very quick amount of time written between sometime after Christ died somewhere around AD 30 somewhere around in there the last book of the Bible written was the book of Revelation somewhere around 95 AD so I mean this to me that's interesting you have the Old Testament written over a span of, a, of about three to four thousand years New Testament in about 70 years okay the the whole of the New Testament written in about 70 years and just about 2,000 years ago all right turn to 2nd Timothy chapter 3 now here's uh, as I'm teaching you why we have two testaments and I'm gonna teach you the difference between the testaments I want to make it clear what I believe what I know you believe and what the Bible teaches that the placement of one verse doesn't overpower the placement of another verse in other words I get back to this Pope thing the popes say they come after the after Peter the Apostle and so God may send down new revelation which would then override whatever would be in the Bible okay well we don't believe that just because you got a verse in the New Testament that doesn't mean that that verse is more true than a verse in the Old Testament 
We do not believe that the two testaments of the Bible compete against each other for our faith or our attention or our belief. We believe what the Apostle Paul told us, 2 Timothy 3, and he tells young Timothy. Timothy was a young bishop, pastor, that Paul was training uh, to be the, he was going to be the pastor after Paul left, and he's giving him these doctrines, and he's teaching him. Uh, Timothy, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. There's a lot in this passage here. The fact that he calls them holy scriptures means that they are holy. They are pure. They are perfect. They do not have errors in them. That from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. So, And we have to assume... Because of history, Paul writes this, let's just, I don't know, somewhere around 50, 60 AD, maybe somewhere around in there. The New Testament, the majority of the New Testament hadn't been written yet, hadn't been put together yet. What was it that Timothy would have been reading? More than likely, the Old Testament. He calls them the Holy Scriptures. And from a child that was known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And here's, I mean, a simple question to those of us who have, who have known these things, have read these things, have learned these things for years, but maybe someone who doesn't know them and, and hasn't been taught these things all their life, they may have this question, can I read the Old Testament and believe in Jesus Christ? Yes. Can I see the cross in the Old Testament? Absolutely. Can I believe, can I believe what God said if I'm reading the Old Testament and be saved? And the answer is yes, because oftentimes when we're teaching someone about being saved and how they can have salvation, believing what God said, oftentimes what, it, what we give them out of the New Testament was already recorded in the Old Testament. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's an Old Testament verse first. So you don't, when it says the Holy Scriptures, it is referring to both Testaments, Old and New Testament, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. This is in contradiction to a fundamentalist doctrine that I, I hate it. Uh, there are varying degrees of it. Some of it I'm okay with, but when it comes to what's called hyper-dispensationalism, this is where you, I'm getting off the bus here. Because it says, as New Testament Christians, our, our, only, our only source of what we should believe for salvation should only come from the books Romans through probably Philemon, which was the last one that Paul wrote in our Bibles. In other words, only what Paul said. That's hyper-dispensationalism. And it says you should only get your doctrine of salvation from what Paul said. Not even the four Gospels, Hebrews, Peter, James, John, Book of Revelation are not for us. They are for the Jews, so we don't get our doctrine on salvation. And I had a pastor tell me this on the phone. He said, well, I, he asked me what I believe about salvation. And I referred to the parable of the seed and the sower. He said, well, I don't get my doctrine from the parables. I said, but excuse me. Jesus taught them in his doctrine saying and we're not to reject the words of Christ. Amen. Okay. So that's my point. Even in what some would call fundamentalist circles, you have people who say you can't get your doctrine on salvation from the Old Testament. That's and they call that anathema. And I'm going, you're an idiot. Okay. There's something wrong with you because verse 16 all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine. So Genesis to Revelation, it's all there for us to learn who God is, how God works, who man is, how God saves man, how man can have eternal life, which is the, the most important issue to deal with ever, how man can have eternal life. And it all comes to us from Genesis to Revelation. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, 
Proof and then reproof. For correction, I've been wrong. I've been wrong a lot of times and have been corrected by this book for instruction in righteousness to teach us instead of that book, instead of the, the Pope's telling... A man who's never been married telling you how to raise a family. <laughs> I don't buy it. And that's just skimming the surface here. The immorality and the abuses of the clergy of the Catholic Church is known all over the world now. Okay? I don't follow their righteousness. Because, like was said, if you, have, if, if you happen to have the money to give to the church and you just happen to be wearing one of those crucifixes that was blessed by some pope, then you can be out committing adultery and have your mistresses while you're wearing it and you're going to heaven. Uh-uh. That's not right. Amen? So the Bible's in the instruction of righteousness. It's telling us what's right and the Bible telling us what's wrong. It's not me telling you. It's not our church telling anybody. It's, it's God. God is the one who created us. God is the one who gives us the rules and he tells us how to live. Knowing that, we'll all, that we all broke them. That's why he provides the Savior for our sins. Amen? Instruction of righteousness that the man of God may be perfect Truly furnished unto all good works. And so built into this idea is if the source of our doctrine is not perfect, then we can never attain perfection. If the seed is corrupt. How many of you got something in your, raise your hand right now. You know you got something in your refrigerator that if you opened it up and smelled it, you would throw it out immediately. Raise your hand. Okay, yeah, but it tasted good at the restaurant last month. Okay, if it's corrupt, it's no good. So that, that's built into this verse is, number one, it's all of Scripture. We believe all of Scripture for our doctrine and that all of Scripture must be perfect or we can't be thoroughly, and then it says thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If the Bible isn't sufficient enough to tell us what to believe and how to live, who are we going to trust? So that's just part of it. So 2 Timothy, this idea of what I mentioned you for dispensationalism, there's, um, she mentioned that she's taking, she's studying for finals this week. So she's wore out. And I said, you ought to have my job. I'm studying for finals every day. Okay. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God. Now there's a doctrine built into that. Number one, a Christian reads his Bible. Amen. A Christian studies his Bible. Um, God dealt with me one day, even as a pastor. Oh, I went to Bible college. Went to two of them. Big deal. But God put it in my heart. I wanted to know what the Bible said. I wanted to know it. I didn't want to just pretend that I knew something or make it up as I go. And I didn't, wasn't smart enough to just give out my own wisdom. I wanted to know what the Bible said. So a Christian is going to study to show themselves approved unto God. Approved unto who? Who approves you? It is God. For those of you who say to us, we don't want you judging us, we won't. You're right. Only God judges. But if I were you, I would find out how he's going to do it. Because if one man can make up his own set of rules about God, another man can do it too. And a lot of people do it. So it says, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so th th this idea of hyper-dispensationalism says that God has these seven 
time spans, one of which you'll never find in the Bible. I don't care if you looked a thousand years, you'd never find it. These seven time spans and that God has different truths during these different time spans. Like the law of Moses was the way of salvation for the Jews in the Old Testament, which is not true. The law doesn't save anybody. Okay? Um, and then you have people who dissect out only the parts of the Bible that they receive. Their, they say it's all true, but only this part of it is for us. Which basically means the Bible disagrees with my doctrine, but I flush out the parts that disagree with what I say. Is That's what they're doing. And basically you're doing the same thing that every other stinky religion does. Is throwing out what disagrees with you and what contradicts what you say. So it occurred to me one day when it rightly dividing the word of truth that it, God didn't leave it up to us to rightly divide it. It's already done. Old Testament, New Testament. Now, just because I like to do stuff like this, there are 1189 chapters in the Bible. Now that's an odd number. Not strange odd, it's a not an even number. Which means that if you divide it by two, you're going to have 594 chapters on one side and 594 chapters on the other side with a chapter in the middle. One chapter of the Bible in the middle of the Bible and it's Psalm 117. Turn there, I have it up on the screen, but I want you to turn there and you just mark it down. This is the middle chapter of the Bible and it has two verses in it. It's the only chapter of the Bible with two verses in it. The only one. And it's in the middle of a perfectly symmetrical Bible. When you think about it, it's perfectly symmetrical. That you have this division of chapters. When you go to the middle chapter, it has two verses on it. And these two verses have 33 words in them exactly. Oh, praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all you people, for his merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. <laughs> praise ye the Lord. Amen. So it's perfect. How long, and how long would it be perfect? Forever. That's what he said. So you mark that as the middle chapter of the Bible. It's got 33 words in it. And this is what it would look like on your body. Your body is symmetrical. In other words, the right hand looks, is in symmetry with the left hand, but your body's not equal. Unless you happen to be one of these gifted, ambidextrous people who can pitch right-handed and left-handed, bat right-handed and left-handed. There used to be a commercial on TV, there was a guy, and this is a real true story. He was drawing on a chalkboard a drawing while he was writing out an equation simultaneously and it wasn't a camera trick he was doing it I can't talk and play the piano at the same time I can sing and play the piano at the same time but I cannot talk words and play the piano at the same time okay so but you have a weak side and a strong side just like you do the Bible John 1 17 this is my my reading for yesterday for PMO for the law was given by Moses, but, notice the word but there, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So out of the two, Jesus Christ or Moses, who you pick for salvation? The one who died. Okay, the one who died for your sins. So it's just like the body with the, with the spine in it, the 33 bones of the spine. And you have a spine chapter in your Bible with 33 words in it symmetrical on both sides it's that that's the to me stuff like this gives us the order that the bible's in it shows us that the bible is not just a collection of random religious philosophies it's a book of perfect order matthew 25 i'll show it to you like this matthew 25 the 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 difference in strength in your body you have a a strong side and a weak side. With most people, not all, with most people, it is the right hand. Okay? Some, my sister was left-handed. So there were places that we couldn't sit next to and eat. 
Okay, I could not sit at her left side and eat next to her because we would bump elbows. Okay, so change sides. Then we're perfect, right? Anyway, so look at, you have this given to you in the scriptures, a strong and a weak side. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, Matthew 25, 31, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Now, think about this and as I make this point. If you were going to have a war between sheep and goats, who would you bet on? The goats. Why? They're a lot more gifted toward warfare than the sheep are. Right? Okay. But look who gets what side. He shall set the sheep on his right hand, the goats on the left. And I want you to think about this. The Bible is symmetrical, but it's not equal. And there is an inequality in the number of books in the Old Testament versus the New Testament. There's 39 books in the Old Testament. 27 in the New. There's clearly more, and there's a lot more words, a lot more words in the Old Testament than there is in the New a lot more chapters, a lot more words, a lot more books. And it took longer to write. But clearly, the strength is on the right hand. The New Testament. Isn't that neat? Okay? And, that, and that's what he's doing here. He's, when he put the sheep on the right hand, the goats on the left, because he tells us, well, you, I don't have it up there, but he tells us later on at the end of that chapter, the goats are given into eternal punishment but the sheep into everlasting joy and righteousness. Whew. Amen. So watch this. It's not the size of the testament that matters. Ask David. Ask David. Little David. Standing up against Goliath. It's not how big you are that matters. Amen. It's where God's power is. God's power happens to be on his right hand. So we look in Revelation 5 and we see in God's right hand that book sealed with seven seals. Not his left hand, it's his right hand. Where is Jesus right now, right this second? Sitting at the right hand of, and he said it, the right hand of power. Okay, to sit at the right hand of God, the right hand of power. So the right side of your Bible, having less words... Yet there's more power in those words than there is in all of the Old Testament. Romans chapter 8. Turn there. Verse 1. There is therefore now. Now there's not. So for 4,000 years, man walked in iniquity and sin and transgression. With no remedy. But now. Now that Christ has come. We have this no condemnation period. Now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life of Christ Jesus. Hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Look at the two laws. You're seeing the two laws there. The two covenants. The law, the spirit of life, the New Testament, in Christ Jesus, had made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. And it'd be like asking me to sign my name with my left hand. Of course, my wife would say, it looks like your right hand, because I've seen your right hand signature. It's not much to talk about. Okay, but clearly, I can do things with my right hand that I cannot do with my left hand. Clearly, it's that way with most people. So what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So in mentioning the two divisions of the Bible, we also mention the two births. The first birth, we're birthed in weakness, birthed in corruption. The second birth, however, birth in incorruption and in power. Amen? And that's everlasting. E eternal life versus temporary life. Um, Exodus 31. Here's some... 
I love this. Turn to Exodus 31, 32, 34. Turn there. We'll have prayer here in a little bit. But I'm giving you the typology. God not just saying two testaments. Him illustrating it. Giving us the visualization of why two testaments but not three. Why we don't believe in another testament of Jesus Christ. Like the Book of Mormon or papal infallibility. Whatever you call it, it's the same idea. It's that there, these new revelations trump what's in the Bible. You'll hear Kenneth Copeland say this all the time. Don't let, your, don't let your tradition trip you up now on what I'm saying to you. And what he's telling you is, don't believe the Bible, believe him. Because he's got new revelations from God, which is a lie. He's fake. I'd take some of his gold, feed a bunch. Take, sell that jet. Feed some poor people, amen? Exodus 31, 18, he gave unto Moses. Moses is a type of Christ. When he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony. But couldn't have God put them on one? Was it because he ran out of space that he had to put it on two? No, he's showing you the example. Table, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. Chapter 32, verse 15, Moses turned and went down from the mount with the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables written on both their sides, the one on one side and, and on the other were they written. That matches the book in Revelation chapter 5, by the way. It's written on both sides. The book in Ezekiel that Ezekiel, the scroll that Ezekiel ate was written on both sides. Why? To show completeness. You write it on one side of the paper, you've got the back side. Can we add anything else to it? Not if we write, not if we fill the paper, we can't. Amen? Not if we fill the paper. If we fill the paper, we can't add anything to it. And that's the example that he's given to us. So in Exodus 31 and 32, you have Moses coming down the first time with the two tables. Then, Exodus 34, you have him coming again with the two tables. The first Time Moses comes down, it's a picture of Christ's first coming. That's God speaketh once. Second time Moses come down. Look at what it says though. Exodus 34, 29. It came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand. When he came down from the mount that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. This time he's coming down, his face shining like the sun. Just like Christ. Amen. I love it. I love it. So... Not just the doctrine, God drawing a picture for us, illustrating it for us. There's two, there's two testaments. And Christ, Christ knew, just like Israel. Moses comes down the first time, Israel, they don't, they don't receive it. And they're broken. The, that law, that first covenant, broken by Moses. However, the second one, when Jesus comes the second time, all that thou hast said will we do. They're going to believe it. Amen. They're going to believe it that second time. Whew. I love it.